Hello and welcome to the PhD Life Raft podcast. I'm Emma Brzezinski and today I am talking to the gorgeous Libby Bennett and our focus is around undertaking a PhD with an existing mental health condition. So we talk about Libby's own experience of OCD but we also talk more generally about the culture of ableism that is around in academia and the need to challenge that. Um, as well as talking about how to support friends and colleagues who may be struggling with mental health issues. So I do hope you enjoy the episode. Libby. Hi Emma. Thank you so much for being here. Um, We have known each other for quite a long time. I do feel we have to say that. Um, Actually, I was your PhD advisor. Um, As you know, I don't know why I'm telling you this, you know that. I've just told everybody else that. Um, And um, and then since then, we have worked together um, on the Breathing Space Project and you have brought so much um, gorgeous energy and really creative ideas as well as experience and wisdom um, in the mental health area to that. So I am delighted that you said yes Um, and were willing in particular to talk about undertaking a PhD with um, a recognised mental health condition yes and so um thank you for that because I I think that there's not enough said about that um and we we're going to go into that in a minute Um, but first of all I always start with um asking people to tell us a little bit about their own story through the PhD journey um and to where you to where you are now great okay well I um I applied for a PhD with what feels now like quite a broad idea really but I just had found the right department and the right supervisor and knew I wanted to do a PhD um thought broadly I wanted to do it on sort of outdoor big events um with some folk elements ended up at the, actually at the end of the first year making that much more focused on um folk singing and walking as interrelated practices and so still very much looking at landscape but I will say that I obviously then had to rewrite um quite a lot of my work after the first year um so anyone in that boat solidarity Mm. um I then also as well as my mental health I was physically very poorly um, and had to have a big operation in my writing up year Mm. um so I took six months away from my PhD during my writing up year which was very difficult but also not not the end of the world because I think sometimes a bit of an enforced break away from your research is not a bad idea Mm. um, to have to come Mm. back with it but there were a few challenges certainly um and I was very pleased to have it finished within four years really considering what else was going on Um, it was an amazing achievement everybody I just want to to acknowledge that you went through absolutely so much during that time and uh yeah and it's a fantastic PhD so yes oh thanks very much Emma I'm trying to um write my book proposal at the moment and I'm a little bit sort of got I've got stuck into the three p's of um right procrastination paralysis perfectionism so it's it's nice to hit nice to be reminded that it's good research to go back to it is fantastic Um, and then I spent you know a bit of time working to finish off uh, the PhD, which a lot of people have to do, and is and I know is really difficult. Um, so I did some market research. I was a waitress on and off for about ten years, all the way through my studies. I was then really lucky to get a postdoc uh, looking at street uh, music and street theatre, uh, busking with Professor George Mackay at UEA. Um, that was extended then to write a report with um, George Mackay on the Connected Communities Programme, AHRC. And then I was really lucky to um, land my three-year lectureship at the University of Essex, lecturing in drama, which is where I am now. So I think that takes us to now. Yes. And I also just want to say it's not luck, it's because you're brilliant. <laughs> um, incred- yeah, so I could... Uh go on about how great you are I I probably will again in a minute um I only invite lovely people on this podcast you see um so so we we just said that the the actual PhD itself was was made even more challenging by a lot of other 
um, things that were going on at the time. But they, they had you come into that already having a, um, a known uh, mental health condition that you were working with. Yeah. Um, and that is an experience I'm aware that other people might be having. And I just, as I say, we don't talk about that enough. And I just welcome hearing from you how that was. Mm. Um, yeah. I think I'll start by saying when I was doing my undergraduate is when I was diagnosed with OCD. It was in my third year. There was various things going on, but I think also sometimes that's just it. You know, you just do happen to have um, an imbalance in the brain or predispositions Mm. towards something. It was quite isolating at the time, but I very quickly got into the university system. I went and asked for help and was given excellent CBT, knew what I was um, experiencing. I had a name for it. I'm definitely someone who thrives on knowledge. So mm. once I knew it was obsessive compulsive disorder and I could research that and look at other people and see how they were dealing with it, everything got much easier. So I'd say the most and first import the most and f- the first and most important step is to um, talk to somebody and, and to get a name for what you're going through. Because always it's the unknown that's really um unsettling I think and as um, you say I think then it can be really useful isn't it there, there are great support systems there yeah. um and you can access that um once you as you say once you reach out for that yeah and it's very isolating OCD the, the way that I experience it so it's obsessive it's obsessive thoughts um that lead you to have compulsions I have a form that's um generally known as pure O so purely obsessional and my thoughts my intrusive thoughts take the form of um worrying about causing harm to people so it it's very it, people can feel very ashamed of that form mm. of OCD and it takes a lot longer to talk about it uh, mm. I, I would still say now that I'm not always comfortable with talking about it because if people don't understand OCD they'll be like oh that person thinks about killing people all the time they must be like not very well or a bit dangerous and if actually neither is true um but yes yeah, so around that time I wanted to study for a master's and I just thought that having this like really intense anxiety condition was going to mean that I wasn't suited for academia and around that time I heard an MP talking to the commons um about his experience of OCD and I felt really inspired by that and realised that it didn't have to be a limitation on what I could achieve. Um, so I hope that by talking about it now um, as a lecturer, that that might be the, the case for other people as well. Because yeah. there's a lot of misinformation about it, isn't there? Yeah. And it also now has become a kind of problematic shorthand. Oh, I'm so OCD. Which, and as we all know, well, many of us know, that, that, that those kind of being... Um, what people might colloquially understand as OCD actually is is quite a way away from, um, as you say, the intrusive thoughts, which is which is more where the core of it of it lies. Absolutely, and it's an extremely debilitating, mm. disabling um, condition that you know absolutely is not that your house is tidy. In fact, usually mm. you're very ill. Your mm. house is. Mm. anything from anything but tidy Mm. and so I I went and did my MA and I was really pretty well throughout my MA I don't remember there being an issue during that time um and then I'd say in my with with studying my PhD I think that having a recognized condition kind of benefited me in some ways because I think that most PhD students go through a period of bad well-being yes you know whether that turns into a diagnosed condition or not certainly people struggle so I think I had some of the tools already in place mm-hmm. and I knew how to recognize symptoms and I knew where to go for help I would say the flip side of that is that perhaps I let things go on for too long because I was more used to having very severe problems that maybe I didn't recognise when they weren't so severe. And actually when my habits or the way that I was pushing myself or the way that I was working weren't healthy. Um, I didn't register my condition officially at the university either. I um, My supervisor knew and was extremely supportive Um but I didn't register it. And in retrospect, I would have done. 
partly because you can have um really brilliant adjustments made for your viva for etc mm. but also mm. because i think it's important from a statistical point of view that people realize that people are studying with recognized conditions so i'll just say that i didn't i didn't officially recognize and um, register it and i wish i had mm. Mm. and i think you're making a really good point there in terms of actually people who come um with a recognized condition who know themselves have have usually been um in some kind of therapeutic program so have an awareness of what they're working with actually can do a lot better than people who the 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 challenges come and they they don't have the tools to deal with them absolutely and also universities and i really would say this universities are some of the best places where you can get quick free counseling and support mm-hmm. and once you're out of the education system both of those things are really difficult so you know as soon as you have an issue and as soon as you need to talk to somebody I would just urge people please use the resources that are there because it's actually strangely the sort of the best time you could be poorly in some ways in terms of getting access to, to help. Exactly. And access to diagnostic um, testing and things like that. So, yeah, absolutely. I would totally second that. Although understand that that may feel threatening or um, may feel scary, actually, to sort of step out and go, actually, something's going on and I'm not I'm not quite sure what is what is happening. Um, But there, there there are skilled and empathic people out there who want to help you um talking about people who want to help I know you and I talked a lot about um kind of peer support Mm. and as you said lots of people on their PhD journey um feel unwell become uh you know have anxiety depression to uh, to differing degrees um how yeah some thoughts I'm, I'm just asking for some thoughts around um how to support others the support that if there was support that you've received that you were really appreciative of uh first and foremost talk about it mm-hmm. um the more that we talk about these things the less stigma they'll have the more that people are going to feel able to I still feel a bit nervous at times doing it it's never going to be entirely comfortable to admit that you you know, regularly have intrusive thoughts about harming people. That's not necessarily how anyone wants to be perceived. So I think I went through a journey of realising that OCD is something I have, not something I am. Mm. Um, Mm. And with that, you know, I was, I was reflecting on why I didn't register my, my OCD. And I, and I honestly think it's sort of two things, maybe still the stigma, not wanting, wanting to be a successful academic and not wanting Mm. that against my record, which of Mm. course is ridiculous but there you are you know these are the sort of thoughts that you have mm. um and the second kind of thinking I wasn't ill enough because it was something quite cyclical with me and for months I would be fine and then I would have little bad patches I think I saw I didn't think that I was sort of ill enough to register it or have adjustments made so mm. um talk talk about it all the time supporting your peers um find ways to have conversations with people that aren't confronting if possible um but go past just how are you uh, I think if you recognise that there might be a patch of bad well-being um, in a peer or a friend, just maybe begin to to open the conversation up about it. Maybe point them towards where they might have help, um, or suggest sort of signing up for the sort of program that you and I run on. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, supervisors can be a huge, huge part of actually both the problem and the solution. <laughs> yeah (laughs) um if you're a supervisor listening to this like please please have open conversations with your students about mental health problems Mm. um and let's get away from the toxicity that this is normalized that would be my biggest thing to anyone to peers to the people going through it to supervisors I very much felt and we've had conversations about this Emma it led to some Mm. of our work but I very much felt that there was a sort of club that was like oh yeah everyone goes a bit mad during their PhD or like oh yeah you will come out with some issues and I was like so basically we're sending people into a PhD program that makes them extremely anxious gives them mental health problems and then they become academics can't recognize their own mental health problems and then continue to supervise students and not get them to recognize their problems Mm. and that for Mm. me just feels like a bit of a recipe disaster um total recipe for disaster (laughs) (laughs) 
as I say, I, I was not included in this. I had a really brilliant, um, really supportive supervisor who was extremely kind. Um, and those skills are just as important as being an academic mentor. They really are. And I think that there are still, I know that there are still people in the academy that are of the opinion, if you can't handle the heat, get out of the kitchen. But what a diversity of thought we would lose if people who need help or ask for help are told they aren't good enough or they can't do a PhD. Um, this is the mentality we have to change because most people are feeling that. So the ones who aren't saying it are going to get really ill in the long run. Mm. I think there was just a really interesting um conference around ableism in academia and I think there's a whole big discussion to be had around that in terms of what 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 is this culture about that doesn't welcome diversity and that's fundamentally what we're talking about isn't it people who see the world in a different way and who experience the world in a different way um Absolutely. yeah and you know and that all it all plays into don't um you know, don't be tweeting about the fact that you're working at the weekend. Don't send your supervisors or your supervisees emails at 11 p.m. at night. You know, it all plays into the same thing about how do we have really healthy working environments. But absolutely, um, this conflation of mental illness with weakness is mm. one I, I think still needs some work in the academy. Absolutely. Absolutely. Here, here. I can feel myself getting all... Yeah. Um, and... and student minds are doing some brilliant work on this yeah. as we know and so I will put the links to that in in the show notes so that people are able to access um the resources that they have which which are fantastic um and just to agitate too isn't it agitate for you don't have to accept a toxic situation um my hope is these PhD students coming through this this next generation will be the ones to shift the culture mm. that if you don't tolerate it that you you will make changes anything else to say on that before we before we go to your top tip which is my unfair moment of the of the episode <laughs> anything um, you feel we've missed I think it's again just look at the warning signs think through both for yourself and your peers and for your supervisees um people can function at quite a high level and not be very well for quite a long time until mm. there's a crisis point and certainly in my first year I got to a crisis point it sort of coincided with me changing my topic so I think I was hiding away a little bit from the fact my PhD wasn't working but just actually totally separately from that my OCD was getting bad it's quite often really bad in the height of summer this was around summer solstice um it's probably the illest I've ever been with OCD I didn't sleep for five nights in a row and had to be taken in sort of as an emergency case to be essentially tranquilized so that I would finally go to sleep um if I was frightened to in my sleep so um I then ended up having a sort of enforced breakaway for my PhD and I think that if you'd have spoken to me maybe two three months before that I'd already probably have been showing signs of not being very well and I just let them go and let them go and let them go so we've worked with students haven't we on the um what what do I look like when I'm well Yes. And what do I look like when I'm not well? Yes. And I think any of those worksheets where you can kind of have that and know and think, actually, there's this middle period where, OK, I'm not super unwell, but maybe I'm not sleeping very well or my personal hygiene isn't great. Or actually, I do spend at least two hours of the day worrying. Or when I see an email from my supervisor, I feel my like I feel dread. I feel mm. my heart sink. You know, any of those things. That's not normal. Mm. We need to move away from that being normal. Mm. Mm, absolutely absolutely and that sense of self-knowledge again is is really important mm. um to just yeah to check in with yourself really I know it's a kind of cliche but it's it's fundamental um thank you so now I'm going to ask you for a top tip which may be just recapitulating something you've already said because there's been so many thoughtful things <laughs> so many top tips already here what what would you offer for people to take away? Um, overlying top tip, get help, um, get support. And again, I say this, it's the freest and the quickest counselling you'll ever receive. Mm. <laughs> so mm. you know, really make use of it. Um, and the sort of byline to that is register, register your, register your condition. You know, even if you just think, 
well, I'm not that poorly. I just have anxiety once a year or, well, I've got very low level depression. Um, okay, well, I have OCD, but I haven't had it for four years. Just, you know, be on the system. Be, yes. be there so that, so that adjustments can be made for you um, yes. rather than you having to adjust to to the university. Absolutely. And I know this from kind of from the other side is that actually as supervisors and as examiners, it, that gives us permission to, you know, think about you know um extenuating circumstances thinking about um uh the regulations and what we can do with those so i i yeah i think that is a brilliant piece of advice thank you so much libby um for sharing your own personal material um thank you for being a beautiful person too and um all the work that you are doing um and Thank you all for listening. Thanks, Emma. Thanks for having me on.